Good evening. Good evening. And thank you very much. Thank you for sharing it again. Our service for tonight, uh, for our midweek Lent, uh, is uh, printed in the bulletin with the exception for the hymns. And I should have said, I'm Pastor Crowley from St. Peter's, and it's a pleasure to be with you. We begin with our opening hymn, which is 560, Drawn to the Cross, which Thou hast blessed. May God bless our worship. As you're able, we rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always shine, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. We stand before the Lord today, gathered in his holy name, aware of our sinfulness, confessing that we deserve nothing but his eternal wrath and punishment. We have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed. Today we earnestly seek forgiveness in Christ. We boldly confess our sins before God and one another, pledging our intention to turn our hearts from sin toward the living Christ. We confess together. We confess to you, O Lord, that our lives, what our mouths have spoken, we have proclaimed love for you, but have been loveless. We have boasted of our faithfulness and have been faithless. We have sinned against you by failing to live as your redeemed and beloved children. Although we deserve only punishment, we seek your forgiveness in Christ our Lord. Take heart. It is God who's given, God himself who has given his son Jesus Christ to die for you and for all people. Be confident in what he speaks to you today. I as a called and ordained servant of the word Announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together our prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. Though we have in no way deserved your goodness, you still abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. Give us, we pray, your Holy Spirit, 
that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness toward us, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we sing, Chief of Sinners, Though I Be, 611. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 62 and 63. Behold, the Lord is proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. And they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Response of Psalm 70. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, Aha! Aha! May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation evermore say evermore, God is great. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. 
You are my help and my deliverer, O Lord. Do not delay. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. As you're able, we rise for the reading of our Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel and the reading, uh, the, the text for tonight's message is from Luke chapter 22 and 23. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We've heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated as we sing our hymn, God Loved the World So That He Gave, 571.
God's grace and his peace be multiplied unto each of you tonight from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for tonight's message is from our gospel reading, read just a few moments ago. Please join with me in a word of prayer. We pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your presence and peace, for the privilege to come to your house to hear your word and receive your gifts. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice and for your victory through your cross and empty tomb, may we ever fix our hearts and eyes ever on you and know and share and declare that good news to everyone. I pray now that the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart may it ever be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus, our Savior's name, we pray. Amen. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, as you come in the door and you look on the... Uh, the bulletin cover, I guess the two words for my sermon title maybe isn't the most encouraging words you thought. They're not the nicest words. Blind ignorance. We think about a person who is blind that can't see. But we also think of spiritual blindness at times, don't we too, in Scripture, in our sin. We could not see God or come to Him. And ignorance, how do you put that one nicely? Well, thinking you know when you don't really know, in a sense, is ignorance, isn't it? So that's the theme we'll look at. And we find in our text for today, in the Gospel of Luke, a familiar portion of Scripture. It's Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Now, if you know anything about the Sanhedrin, there were 70 of the religious leaders that they voted on or came to decisions on certain things, like Jesus. Seventy of them, there were 35 and 35, and if there was a tie, the high priests would cast the deciding vote. Well, Jesus is, in our text, in kind of a streamlined, a shortened, focused gospel. A little different than the other gospels, they're a little longer. We don't hear of Caiaphas, though he's there. We don't even hear of the false witnesses, though we know that they're there too. So it's important that we look at what it has that God led Luke to write so we can focus on what God is trying to get across to us tonight and through his word. We'll find that there's encouragement and comfort, especially, of course, in Jesus. But also there is a spiritual you might say, caution, that we need to hear too. Notice I say the word we, which includes myself. So what does it say? Let's get right to it. Luke chapter 22, you'll see it in the bulletin. Listen to hear if you hear something interesting. Okay? I see it. We'll see if you see it. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When the day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to the, their council, and they said, well, stop there. Did you catch it? What was interesting? How many of us, has anybody ever been pulled over for a speeding ticket? Now, don't raise your hand, because I'd have to raise my hand, too. But did they give you the fine even before you went to trial? Did you get punished ahead of time? You didn't, did you? We in our land are considered, what, innocent until proven that's not what's going on here, is it? Jesus is getting punished, and rather cruelly, even before he goes to trial. Did you notice that? It almost seems like it's a done deal, doesn't it? The conclusion is foregone, isn't it? 
He hasn't even come before the Sanhedrin, and they already perceive him to be a condemned person, don't they? He doesn't even have a chance, does he, as he comes before them. Wow. Guilty until proven innocent in this case, isn't it? So here it is. It's clear and simple. Jesus will be condemned. No doubt about it. Now notice the next part. Luke invites us to see the council, the Sanhedrin, is speaking with one voice. I have to say I was a little naive. You know, before Safer at Home with COVID, I thought, man, maybe here's a time when the politicians and the leaders will actually work together for the benefit of the people. How silly was I? Really? What was I thinking? So you know what? When it comes to the Ukraine, I have no doubt I know what's going to happen. They're not going to work together. But notice here, that's for good. But notice this, this is for evil that we're talking about. This is an innocent man, and notice that in Luke it speaks of them as one voice. All 70 plus the chief priests are all together united for evil, aren't they? Each and every one of them. And it doesn't just say it once, it says three times. They speak with one voice. And they all said, so they all said, all of them together, and at last, the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. Evil is speaking with one voice here. They're unified. And the Lord Jesus himself also speaks, but he speaks more than once. But when he does, when he replies, they say to him, or he says, it doesn't really matter what I say, because you're not going to listen anyway. And so it kind of goes to what he says earlier on. This is your hour. Evil is going on. It's almost as if the Lord is letting go. Letting evil have his way, its way. And so when they first say to Jesus, if you are the Christ, tell us, Jesus says, if I tell you, you won't believe me. And if I ask you, you won't answer it's like this. Jesus says, you really don't care what I say, do you? You're blindly against me. Your mind is made up, and nothing, nothing can change it. All you know is where you want to go with this, and we know where it's going. And then the Lord speaks to them, and he adds a warning, but also words of encouragement. He says this, from now on, the Son of Man, I, Jesus, he says, shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. It's coming soon. Very soon it will happen, Jesus says. My victory, my exaltation to God's right hand, it's coming. Beware, repent, leave. But Jesus' words go right past them. They just want to get enough against Jesus so they can hand him over to Pilate because Pilate is the only one who has the authority to execute Jesus. So for the second time they speak, so you are the Son of God then. And Jesus answers again in a sort of indirect way. You say that I am. Do you hear yourselves in a sense he's saying? You don't even hear what you're saying about me. And you don't believe it. You don't believe what's coming out of your own mouth. And no, they don't believe. They just want to get it done. So they speak together. And a third time, what further testimony is needed? We've heard ourselves. We've heard it ourselves from his own lips. Heard what? He didn't say anything, did he? They heard what they wanted about Jesus. They're so bent on executing, destroying our Lord, 
that they'll do anything to get them over there so that the Gentiles can torture and crucify and kill them. As Luke gives us events, it's streamlined. It's focused with one voice, with one intent. The Sanhedrin is determined to eliminate Jesus. They are captive to their own unbelief. Their unbelief. And friends, that's really a good definition of prescribing unbelief. Here's one way to say it. Unbelief is blind ignorance. You see this in the Gospel of Luke in Nazareth, in the synagogue. Jesus read from Isaiah to his people, his own hometown. And he speaks about recovering of sight for the blind, and he meant it literally, but also he also even more speaks of recovery of spiritual blindness. In teaching his disciples, for instance, about how they needed to grow in their faith and understanding, Jesus said, can a blind man lead a blind man? Unbelief is blindness. And it's ignorance, too. Perhaps we hear this probably the most powerfully from Jesus' words from the cross. The first words. Father, forgive them. Finish it. For they know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. Unbelief is blind ignorance. The problem when you are both ignorant and blind is, well, you don't even realize what you're doing, do you? Luke has uh, told us that Satan is behind it all. All the evil that's coming against Jesus. But I don't know about you, I can't imagine that the Sanhedrin really thinks that they're serving Satan. I don't think that's the case, do you? They think they're serving God. But Satan really is the master here of what's going on with them. And they're following right along. They're blind and they're ignorant, sadly. This means that that night they're wrong in two ways at the same time. First, they thought that if they destroyed Jesus, that they were serving God and getting rid of blasphemer. And secondly, the council members had no clue that they were blind and ignorant. In fact, they serve not the purposes of God, or they're blind and ignorant that they are serving ultimately the purpose of God, but not in the way they thought. Their unbelief made them wrong twice. Because Jesus is God's son, thanks be to God. And God's plan in the world and for the world will produce the greatest reversal the world has ever seen. It will happen in Jesus through him. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Yes, indeed, Jesus, the first, willingly becomes the last. He takes on our human flesh, an evil plan against him to reach its goal. Even before hearing, they treated him like a condemned person. And with one voice during the hearing and after it, they reject Jesus and hand him over to Pilate to die on a Roman execution on a cross. The first chooses by love, his doing willingly, to become last for all of us, including you and me. And the last will become first. The evil came against Jesus so that it wouldn't come against us. Sin and Satan and even God's righteous judgment itself came against the innocent, pure Son of God, our Savior. But then on the third day, he stripped it all away. He stripped off our sin and our guilt and our shame 
because he laid it upon him. And his life destroyed death. And Satan was overcome and defeated. And God's judgment was overturned by God when the Son of Man was raised from the dead to sit at the right hand of God's power. They meant it for evil, didn't they? But in their blind ignorance, they served God. God meant it for good. Power in this world's eternal good through Him. A stunning reversal of grace and mercy. Thanks be to God He did. Now, for ourselves in life, I said in the beginning that we have to be careful with this portion of Scripture. This focused, streamlined version of Jesus before the Sanhedrin and speaking with one voice. I mentioned at the beginning about that. And the problem comes is when we start thinking, I would never be so blind, or I would never be so ignorant. In fact, we can even hear ourselves saying, I am better than that. And that's what can be dangerous for all of us. We sang a hymn earlier, Chief of Sinners. Remember how that goes? Tell me whether it goes this way. Chief of sinners though I be, you're a worse sinner than me. Is that how it went? I don't think so. But in our sinfulness we can think that, can't we? How did it go? Chief of sinners though I be, Jesus shed his blood for me. Thanks be to God. It happened to the people, God's people, in the time of Jesus. It can happen to us too. Let me show it. If you remember... Jesus is the house of Simon and the woman of irrepute comes and washes his feet with her tears, right? And dries his feet with her hair. And Simon said in his mind and heart, if Jesus knew what kind of woman she was, he would have never allowed her to do it. I'm paraphrasing. The cue is he did. He knew exactly what kind of woman she was. And she knew what kind of woman she was too. And she was going to the right place to Jesus himself, humbly seeking forgiveness and restoration. She received it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Or think about the two in the temple. Remember? The Pharisee and the tax collector. Sound familiar? If I remember right, I'm paraphrasing the Pharisee's prayer. Thanks be to God, I worship and I tie. Thanks be to God, I'm not like this tax collector over here. And the tax collector prayed a simple prayer. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we know that only one went away having his prayer heard. And it wasn't the Pharisee, it was It was the tax collector. So tonight I invite you to, you might say, a godly fear and compassion. 
I invite you to embrace God's love and compassion and mercy for people who are trapped in blind ignorance and unbelief. Back then and so even today as well. Compassion, compassion I say that because you see, this very compassion from Jesus on the following afternoon. It's Jesus' enemies meant it for evil. Yes, they did. And it was sin that they did, and we can't wink at it. It was evil, and it can't be condoned. But when you read about them, or you see this in people today, ask God to prepare our hearts for compassion for those people and for all people. The world around us is chaos, isn't it? But it always, it always has been since Genesis chapter 3. And sin and wrong are still sin and wrong. But when the greatest evil in history of the world was happening, when nails were being driven into the hands and feet Jesus prayed as he hung on that cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And he prayed it even for you and for me. Compassion, mercy, and love. When we read these verses from long ago, and when we see spiritual blindness and ignorance in our world today, ask God to help you and me to show compassion for those who do not know and those who cannot see. So we hear the message, the word of God from Luke, and we pray that God will grant us that humility and a godly fear, not arrogant comparing. Why did the Pharisees, the people, hate Jesus so much? How about his hometown? because he would not let them compare others to them. We play on a level playing field, don't we? When Jesus was in Nazareth, his hometown, and he preached, at first they were thrilled. A hometown boy. He's one of ours. But then when he starts preaching that he's come for even the Gentiles and the sinners. They are up in arms. Because they thought they were better than that. As if they didn't need Jesus. And so, of course, they tried to kill him. But it was not his time. They meant everything for evil. But God meant it for our good and the good of our world. And his son died as the innocent one in our place. And he rose in victory and authority to forgive and to save even you and me. What a wonder our God is. What an amazing, gracious God he is. Because though no merit or intelligence or superiority or anything in us, God has opened our eyes and hearts and enlightened our minds to know and believe in Jesus as our Savior and the Savior of the world. Sometimes we use the phrase, to God be all the glory for our faith this Lenten season and always. And may God use you and me to offer the message of Jesus to whoever we meet. For all people are precious to him. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in the true faith unto life everlasting through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. This time we continue with our offering.
as you're able, we rise as we sing our operatory, On My Heart Imprint Your Image. We pray. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, during the holy season of Lent, you call us to a closer walk with you. Help us to prepare to celebrate the resurrection victory of Jesus with a new and right spirit. Give us loving reverence for you, Father, and the willingness to serve our neighbors. Let us pray to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Lord, this great season of grace is your gift to purify our hearts, strengthen our wills, embolden our outreach, enliven our faith, and teach us how to live with our hearts set on the kingdom that will never be shaken. Let us pray to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. O oh God, we ask for the grace to conquer our complaining, to humble our hard hearts, and to toughen our timid witness. We want to show the world your goodness and glory by being kind to all. Let us pray to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Father, as we meditate upon the suffering and life-giving death of your Son, bring life to our faint praises and move us to abundant thanksgiving. Let us pray to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Lord, the power of the cross reveals our great sin and your greater love. Grant that through our baptismal union with our Savior, we die to sin and live for righteousness now in this present evil age, even as we anticipate our full redemption in the new Jerusalem. Let us pray to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night which he's betrayed, he took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is New Testament of my blood that was shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated for our distribution and hymns of distribution.
receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is Jesus, Refuge of the Weary, 423. Have a very blessed evening and a blessed uh, rest of the one season. Lord be.